All right, everyone, welcome back. It's time to cover some more notes. Back before the break, before spring break, we were talking about multicellular primary producers, and we need to continue. So to refresh a little bit back before spring break, we uh, talked about the green seaweeds, we talked about the uh, red seaweeds, and today we need to talk about the brown seaweeds. So one of the very last things we talked about was Irish moss. Uh, this dessert pudding like uh, me uh, dish that uh, I had a chance to try in in Jamaica when I lived there. It's probably one of the worst things I've ever tasted. So maybe that will bring back some uh, memories of where we left off. So anyhow, so let's talk about uh, about brown algae. Okay, this is in phylum Phaophyta, so Kingdom Protista, phylum Phaophyta. It includes uh, specimens like rockweed, the kelps, and sargassum. We're going to talk about kelps in a minute, and then later we're going to talk more about sargassum because this is an example of a seaweed that we have here in Florida. We see it washed up on our beaches all the time. Uh, almost all members of this group are marine, and most are benthic. Benthic means they grow attached to the bottom or some sort of substrate. So they use those hold fast structures to uh, anchor them to the bottom. Um, Many have these bladders that help them float. Sargassum actually floats on the surface, drifts with the ocean currents, and the kelps, which can get over, over 100 meters long, have to uh, attach to the bottom and then grow all the way up to the surface. So they have these bladders full of air to help them rise. Uh, so a little bit here on uh, kelp forests. Kelp forests can be seen along much of the west coast of North America. Kelp are actually large brown algae that live in cool, relatively shallow waters close to the shore. They grow in dense groupings, much like a forest on land. These underwater towers of kelp provide food and shelter for thousands of fish, invertebrate, and marine mammal species. Kelp are very simple organisms that consist of a holdfast, a stipe, and blades. At the bottom is a root-like structure called a holdfast that anchors kelp to rocks and other materials on the ocean floor. Young kelp must compete for space to settle and grow, as the rocky bottom is carpeted with smaller algae and invertebrates like anemones and sponges. The stipe is similar to a plant stem. It is strong, yet flexible, allowing kelp to sway in the currents of the ocean. Many fish use this middle area of the kelp forest as hunting grounds. The blades contain a special gas, which act like a float, keeping the kelp blades close to the surface of the water where they absorb energy from the sun. This ability to float raises the kelp to the sea surface, forming a dense canopy. The canopy serves as a nursery or brood area for many organisms due to the warmer surface temperatures and slower water currents. Many organisms from small fish to birds and even whales use the thick blades as a safe shelter for their young from predators or even rough storms. Kelp forests have a greater variety and higher diversity of plants and animals than almost any other ocean community. NOAA scientists study kelp forests by visiting the same locations over and over to assess the presence and abundance of a variety of organisms. Monitoring allows marine scientists to determine if the kelp forest is changing over time and to identify the cause of those changes, whether natural or human. Healthy kelp forests maintain the existence of thousands of plants and animals, fish stocks, and many ocean and tourism-based businesses. All of these require a thriving ocean ecosystem. We all depend on the ocean for food, oxygen, and even life-saving pharmaceuticals. Do your part to keep our ocean and local waterways clean, litter-free, and healthy.
All right, what a great short video. Uh, several key things to point out. Notice they mentioned how uh, these ecosystems are very biologically diverse. Huge numbers, huge variety of different uh, plants and animals are found here. This is a great time to bring up a term we've used before, and that is a, a keystone species. Uh, kelps are definitely a keystone species. Many, many, many other organisms depend on them in that ecosystem. You remove the keystone species and the ecosystem quite often uh, literally falls apart. Here's another short video on uh, a 360 video kind of immersing ourselves in a, in a, in a kelp forest. We're underwater in 360 degrees at Monterey Bay Aquarium behind the scenes of Big Blue Life. Check out the fish and kelp everywhere and just to help we've added species labels. But why are we here? Well, two reasons. We're here so you can be here too and to see whether doing this in virtual reality gives you a real sense of diving amongst a tremendously important habitat. But what's so special about kelp forests? Well, have a listen to this quote and see if you can guess who said it. <clears throat> I can only compare these great aquatic forests with the terrestrial ones in the intertropical regions. Yet, if in any country a forest was destroyed, I do not believe so nearly so many species of animals would perish as would here from the destruction of kelp. Amidst the leaves of this plant, numerous species of fish live, which nowhere else could find food or shelter. With their destruction, the many cormorants and other fishing birds, the otters, seals and porpoise, would soon perish also. Any guesses? Believe it or not, Charles Darwin said that almost 200 years ago, and he was spot on. And just outside here in Monterey Bay, the kelp forests are healthier than they've been for a long time. And a team... All right, you get the idea, but uh, really need to be able to view to be virtually in this forest. All right, let's keep moving on a little bit. Uh, let's see here, a little bit more. I mentioned earlier that they can grow over 100 meters in length. So they grow up uh, from the seafloor up to the surface and then quite often across the surface, they'll grow like you see in these uh, pictures here. And this and these are the giant sea otters. So they make their home in uh, in the forest and they dive down to the bottom, they'll, they'll find abalone, they'll find clams, they'll find sea urchins, bring them up to the surface, wrap themselves up in the seaweed to hold themselves, and then they'll break open those uh, food items uh, and feed on them. So really neat uh, protected animal, the uh, giant sea otters. Uh, this is river otters like we have here in Florida. This is actually a photo that I took. Uh, not near as big as the giant sea otters. And here's a little video on the sea otters and how they use the, the seaweed, uh, especially the young ones, the pups. When they're first born, they actually really are not even capable of directional swimming. They're basically just little corks floating at the surface. So in the absence of mom, we really have to fill a large role for these guys. Thanks to the pups' completely buoyant pup coats, at the very least, they don't drown. But in the wild, they can just float away. So a mother sea otter often wraps her pup in seaweed when she hunts. A mom takes her pup everywhere, carrying it on her belly, even dragging it through the open ocean with her teeth. But some otters prefer more protected habitats. 18 miles up the coast, north of Monterey, is a seven mile long tidal marsh and estuary called Elkhorn Slough. The calm waters and abundant food make Elkhorn Slough one of the area's most popular otter hangouts. It's also a favorite spot for otter watching. But even here, 
modern mothers work extremely hard to get by. This mother drags her pup out the slough against the current for 45 minutes straight. Dragging her pup right into the middle of these populated areas seems like a colossal waste of precious energy. But this clever mom has a plan. She comes here every day so she can haul her pup out onto a boat's swim step. She uses the step as a playpen to keep the pup safe while she hunts. It's a classic example of otter ingenuity. This mother otter has found a way to adapt and make the most of her close proximity to humans. And since baby otters model their mother's every move, it's possible her pup will acquire this same skill. All right, kind of neat. Uh, let's see here. All right, so the other specimen type of brown algae I want to talk about is sargassum, and we see examples right here. This is the stuff that washes up on our beaches all the time. Uh, it's found out in the Atlantic. It drifts on the surface and can form pretty dense mats. And if you're an offshore fisher, fisherman, fisher person, then you know you always look for the weed line. You look for these mats because hiding up in the seaweed are little crustaceans, crabs, small fish. And then like you see here, just below them, slightly bigger fish and below them, even bigger fish. So a great uh, thing to look for when you're out fishing in the open ocean. Now, we talked about gyres earlier in the year, these circular currents that flow in a circle clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. And this part right here we know is the Gulf Stream. Uh, each section has different names. It's the North Equatorial Current. Um, it, what happens is because of the Coriolis effect, the sargassum and anything else drifting on the surface gets pushed to the center. So in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we have an area called the Sargasso Sea, which is just a huge area, a huge part of the Atlantic Ocean with big, huge, massive mats of the seaweed, of the sargassum, so, uh, and trash and other kind of things that are drifting in the ocean. So we do have this type around here. And can you see the little air bladders right there? I'm kind of pointing to some of them. Yeah, those are the bladders that help it float. And this type of seaweed does not have a hold fast. Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit more about sargassum and especially the sargasso sea. Over one thousand miles wide and three thousand miles long, the sargasso sea occupies almost two thirds of the North Atlantic Ocean. Within the sea, circling ocean currents accumulate floating rafts of sargassum seaweed that shelter a surprising variety of fishes, snails, crabs, and other small animals. Recent research at Ambari showed that in 2011 and 2012, this animal community was much less diverse than it was in the early 1970s. This study was based on field research led by Ambari scientist Ken Smith using the Lone Ranger, a vessel owned and operated by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. During three recent cruises, the team steamed across the Sargasso Sea using dip nets to collect samples of sargassum seaweed and its associated animals. They then classified and counted all of the animals living in the seaweed. When the team analyzed the data from the recent cruises, they were surprised to find that animal communities in the sargassum rafts were significantly less diverse than those observed in the 1970s. For example, 13 species of animals in several different groups. We don't need to watch the whole video, but this gives you an idea of what these mats look like and some of the animals uh, that are found uh, within it. Um, in addition, again, I'm saying this again, in addition to the sargassum floating, we have lots of plastic. And there's a term that maybe you've heard, the Great Garbage Patch or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Huge areas of the Pacific Ocean 
and to a lesser degree in the Atlantic Ocean where there's big mats of plastic, uh, large areas, I should say. And most of that plastic is microplastic, but it's all being pushed into these central areas in the middle of these gyres. And uh, here's a little video about that. You don't have to go to the ends of the earth to see the impact mankind is having on natural habitats around the world. As NBC's Kerry Sanders reports, all you have to do is look at the ocean. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is one of the greatest environmental catastrophes now we do have to. I do have to say something here. Now that is not the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That's basically just some coastline, uh, probably in Asia and local rivers where there's just massive amounts of trash. But that is not what you see in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The ocean today, yet very few people have ever heard of it. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is an enormous trash island in the Pacific Ocean that is composed of 100 million tons of plastic. In extent. It is two to three times the size of the U.S. This giant mass of plastic soup is made up of large pieces of plastic and huge amounts of plastic particles suspended in water. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch was discovered by Captain Charles J. Moore in 1997, and he has been trying to raise awareness and figure out a way to clean the oceans ever since he found the trash island. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is being formed by currents from the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre which is basically a whirlpool of ocean currents and wind. The upper part of this gyre, a few hundred miles north of Hawaii, is where warm water from the South Pacific meets with the cooler water from the North Pacific. Known as the North Pacific Subtropical Convergence Zone, this is also where the trash collects. This convergence zone sweeps trash along the east-west corridor that links two many gyres known as the Eastern Garbage Patch and the Western Garbage Patch. These two gyres together make the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The source of plastic trash for these gyres is coming from the interiors of continents by way of sewers, streams, rivers, and coastlines. The growing number of abandoned plastic fishing nets is one of the greatest dangers from marine trash. These nets entangle many types of sea life, including seals, sea turtles, and other animals, which are often drowned by them. Almost all marine life is endangered by plastic because it does not biodegrade and contains no nutrition. But sea turtles seem especially susceptible. In addition to being strangled by fishing nets, they often swallow plastic bags, mistaking them for jellyfish to main prey. All of this plastic destroys ecosystems and damages the local marine wildlife on an ocean-wide scale. Plastic resin pellets are another common piece of marine trash. They float in the oceans and eventually photodegrade, but that takes many years. In the meantime, they destroy the ecosystem for local albatross. Albatross parents leave their chicks on land in Pacific Islands to search for fish eggs. These albatrosses scoop up these pellets and return to feed the indigestible plastic to their chicks, which eventually die of starvation or ruptured organs. Decaying albatross chicks are frequently found with stomachs full of plastic debris. The first step to help solve this tragic problem is to raise awareness. Very few people know what the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is, and without awareness, there is no way to make an impact. Charles J. Moore believes that 100 million tons of trash is too much and will be too costly to try and move in the oceans. We need to help stop more trash from going into the oceans, and everyone can help do this by contacting the governor and elected officials to ban plastic bottles and plastic bags to combat this problem. Companies should also convert to biodegradable plastics, and this is critically important because otherwise plastics will be sitting in the oceans for thousands of years. It is imperative that we address this issue immediately and that it is destroying marine ecosystems and endangering life on Earth. So let's talk a little bit about these albatrosses. Now, we've uh, these are birds that are mar considered marine organisms. They travel sometimes hundreds of miles across the ocean feeding. And during breeding time, they come back and they feed their young what they collected, the food they ate, what they collected out over the ocean. And quite often that includes plastics. So they directly feed them plastic in the nests. And quite often those chicks do not have the ability to regurgitate stuff they can't digest, you know, similar to like an owl pellet. This is called a bolus. The adults can, but the chicks can't. So they fill up their stomachs with this plastic and then they eventually die, starve to death.
And that's what this video is about. Do we have the courage to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future? with me on a journey through the eye of beauty. Across an ocean of grief. And beyond. So again, you know, all this excess plastic in the ocean, this is some of the, just one of the many negative effects that it has on marine life. So with that, uh, that marks the, the, we'll pretty much stop there for uh, our uh, talk on seaweed again. And you thought I was done. Well, I got three more slides to show you. Um, some of the, the last little bits on brown algae, the brown seaweeds, things that we've already talked about. One is that it's an amazing habitat. Uh, we saw lots of video clips and pictures of that. Uh, we as humans use it also. It's found, it's, it's a thickening agent. It's found in the dental profession, cosmetics, and in foods. One key thing to talk about briefly is that many species have a very high concentration of iodine. Iodine is something that we need in our diet. It helps to regulate our thyroid gland found up here in our neck and early childhood development. It helps with brain development. Now, I'm not saying we need to go out and eat brown algae, eat brown seaweeds, sargassum, and kelp to get our iodine. There are many other uh, ways of getting it. One is the main way that we get it in our diet 
is through iodized salt. This is basically salt that has iodine in it. So if we use salt moderately, we should get all the iodine that we need. Now, if you don't get enough iodine in your diet, it can cause a swelling of the thyroid gland and it can actually form something called a gorder. And if you look at this woman right here, uh, this is Miss Marshall back when I lived in the Bahamas. Uh, she was a basket weaver at the north end of the island and we'd go down and see her. And you see around her neck is a very large growth, uh, a gorder. And it's, it's basically uh, inflamed thyroid. And I'll show you another uh, picture here. You can see it uh, a little bit better there, very large in this case. They can be removed surgically and you know, early on, if she would have had more iodine in her diet, it would have never formed. So now I am done. That's all there is to say uh, that I need to say about the brown